I'm Jason Class, and you're listening to Tenkara Talk. Today, my guest is Chuck Kaminsky, a good friend of mine and an angler with extensive experience in both conventional fly fishing and tenkara. So, Chuck, first, uh, before we get into the topic, would you give us a quick introduction and just a little background about your uh, conventional fly fishing experience and then uh, how and why you got into tenkara? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, as Jason said, my name's Chuck. Last name's Kaminsky. You guys probably see me on Facebook. I'm... I have a tendency to comment on a lot of things you see on a lot of sites. Um, I basically have been fly fishing uh, since I was eight years old, and I'm 62, so I've been at this about 54 years. I grew up up in northern Michigan, uh, and that's really where my fly fishing journey began. My first fly rod was an old Goodwin Gladwin bamboo rod. My grandfather bought me at a yard sale, but in servitude to him, I had to cut his grass three times to pay him back for the fly rod. But... So out of that, I learned, you know, was self-taught to cast, and I was fortunate that I kind of took to it real quick because by the time I was 12 years old, I could outcast most of the adults in my hometown. Wow. Um, I've, uh, I fished quite a few places. I spent 26 years in the military, so out of that, I was able to live around different places of the world, you know, Alaska, Europe, South Carolina, upstate New York, and a few other places. So I was able to experience quite a bit of fishing. I got into Tenkara somewhere around 2013, maybe a little earlier. And what caused me and what drove me to get into Tenkara was that I became really frustrated with the conventional fly fishing industry. Mm. Um, you know, it's become so <sighs> equipment con- dependent. And, you know, every six months there's a new rod coming out you got to have. And people really forget to learn the common basics of fly fishing. Um, and fish in general, and really just go for the buy for solutions all the time. And that really, it was the the simplicity effect that we all talk about that led me into Tenkara. And I have to admit, when Tenkara first started hitting the United States, I made a lot of fun of it. I, you know, it was it's fancy cane pole fishing, it's dappling, some other things. And uh, what happened was, I went to a Tenkara, or excuse me, a Patagonia store in Salt Lake City, and they were doing a soft reopening, and I won a Tenkara. Patagonia rod. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, it, it was, you know, one of those ones that we really probably weren't the best of rods, but right. they were an entry level. Mm-hmm. And I brought it home and I literally didn't use it for almost a month. It sat on my fly time bench. And uh, other friends of mine who were, you know, trying to get into the world of Tenkara style fishing, you know, kept telling me, you know, come on, do this with us. And I, I kind of literally just blew them off. So I finally took this thing to a local tailwater. I Googled how to set it up. I took it out. I fished with it for 30 minutes. And after that, I walked up the hill, got a cell phone signal, called my friend Marty. And I said, look, I apologize. I was a jerk. This is the most fun fishing I've had in probably the last 15 years. (laughs) And that gets us where we are today, where I now am like others, where I own 20 plus 10 car rods. And I don't think I've fished a conventional fly rod probably any time in the last six or seven years. So. Wow, interesting. And um, well, you brought up the uh, the concept of basics, which is our topic for today. Um, so we just returned from a, a rather <laughs> challenging trip on the San Juan, and uh, we we were talking there, uh, standing on the banks, um, just about how um, you know there's there's kind of this lack of uh, an appreciation for the basics when it comes to fly fishing in general, uh, and uh, even tankara. Um, so, you know, uh, before, before we recorded this, I asked Chuck to, to make a list of kind of some of the common um, issues he sees um, with uh, beginners and, and um, you know, just kind of not, not going through the steps and, and like uh, learning the basics uh, first. Um, and I was going to do the same. However, when I saw Chuck's list, it was basically exactly what I was going to say. So uh, there was really no need to make mine. Um, so anyway... Chuck, what, what do you see as kind of the, over, the overarching issue today with, 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 with co- when it comes to um, just, you know, what, what, what's holding people back from really progressing as, a, as an angler or a fly tire for that matter? I think in general, you know, I've tried to give this a lot of thought, you know, as we were building up to, to this session. And, and just I think about this all the time. You know, I, I hate to say some of it's society now where everybody wants quick solutions. Uh, you know, I talk to people all the time. They'll say they find out that I fly fish and they start telling me about some fly fishing experience they've had. And I understand it. 
fly fishing is not the easiest thing to learn. Right. I mean, it's it, too hard. It, right. it can be extremely complicated especially casting you know if you're going to be a conventional fly fisher you really need to take instruction to learn how to cast and cast well as i said during my intro i i was fortunate that i somehow i just picked it up pretty well and but there's a lot of people who don't but out of this example i use my neighbors they went fishing they were up in colorado they hired a guide for the day um and yes they caught fish and i so we started talking about what they learned and what they learned was to put on a bobber slash indicator, throw on a pair of nymphs, weight it, and just flip it overhand out of the boat and drift it through holes and catch fish. Well, out of that, they now consider themselves fly fishermen. Mm. But I see this over and over and over, you know, things that are similar to this, because to do anything and to do it well takes time. You need to put the time and effort in to do some research. Maybe, you know, read a little bit. Maybe go fishing with some folks. Maybe hire a guide and then explain to the guy that you want to learn something more than just flipping a fly over and throwing it through a hole and catching fish. But a lot of it, I think in our society, we want quick, quick success in everything. Nobody really wants to take the time. And I see this more and more and more uh, on the rivers. When I talk to a lot of people, I stand back and I watch people fish and I'm watching them cast and it's, it's like a nightmare. <laughs> And I want to go over and, you know, try to cautiously say, hey, can I give you a hand here? But some people are willing to take your help and some people are not. So, right. But I, a lot right. of I think that's the foundation of it. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, so th there's a lot here to kind of unpack. So let's, let's parse this out a little bit. What are some specific examples? You, you had a lot of examples on your list um, and a lot that I uh, have seen. So, for, for example, one that really hit me over the head is um, people standing where they should be fishing, right? Or vice versa. So, it's, oh, <laughs> I see this all the time. When I drive, you know, to my local rivers, and I'm just driving along the creek looking for a place that doesn't have five cars at it. You know, I can see people lined up and, and you know, they're standing right. I'm like, no, you should be fishing there. <laughs> and it's like, you know, you didn't, it's just, reading water is not. Uh, I think an instinctual thing for some people. Uh, so it's something that you have to learn. And so they may, they may think, oh, well, that looks like where, where I should fish is the deepest spot. And, you know, it's probably has the most fit, you know, the, the rationale for, for why they're going to cast there and stand over here just is, it's, it's not, uh, it's not instinctual for them. Right. Oh, I'm no, sure I, seen this. I see this all the time. And, yeah. you know, and okay. So like I forget to mention, I currently live in the state of Oklahoma and I have two, uh, year-round trout waters that I can fish. They are heavily stocked by the state, so it, the fishing is, let's just say, it's not complicated. But I literally have been at the river before, and I have watched people wade across the river um, and then turn around and fished across the water that they just waded through and then question why they're not catching any fish. Right. Or they get to the river, and the first thing they do is go barging out to the middle of the river when they realize that the hole they should be fishing, as you said, is at their feet. Um, and I think some of that is just, you know, we always see the pictures of people standing in the middle of the river. And they, you, even when I was used to tournament fish, I bass tournament fish a number of years, you know, everybody wants to cast as far as they can. Uh, mm -hmm. With fly fishing, everybody wants to cast as far as they can. Don't realizing, you know, you, your fishing really begins at the shore of that river on the bank. And it really should begin about 20 feet back in that bank when you stop and kind of look what's going on and then make your decision because, as I just said, the hole that you should be fishing, the little bit of a run that you should be fishing, may literally be three feet from that shore. But unless you take the time to learn and understand that and understand behavior and where fish position in a river and why they position, you, you may never gain that lesson and you may never understand that. Right. Um, right. And, you know, and it's, I think, again, the automatic assumption is, well, if it's deep, there must be fish there. So they're going to walk right through that shallow water and all the riffles where the fish could be holding because they don't understand the, uh, where the lies are, right? They, they have no concept of that. So um, it's, it's kind of like you can't just go out there and expect you're going to figure it out like in five minutes, right? And, and um, you know, so it's, it, 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 most people walk by a trout stream and they just see a, a beautiful stream. Right. And then they might see a fish jump or once in a while. Right. But they have no idea why fish jumps. They have no idea what's going on there. But a, a fisherman, a fly fisherman walks by a stream and they see the insects hatching off the water. They, and they know that, oh, this 
this midge is hatching or this mayfly is hatching. And then they see the trout coming up for, oh, and they must be taking the emerger stage of this, right? right? We, we see this whole drama and all the little details and the minutia that's going on there. But the casual observer just stands there and just sees a pretty trout. And so when you walk up to there and attempt to fish it, and you know you're you're not really parsing out all the little different elements of it, right? The the hatches, the the fish behavior, the the water temperature, all the little conditions, right? And the different structure and parts of water. There's a lot there, and it's not instinct. It's not something you're born with, right? I mean, it's kind of something you have to uh, either figure out through a lot of trial and error, or more efficiently, like you said, you know, uh, read books, watch YouTube videos. There's tons of information out there, right? So it really helps to. To not just go in there willy nilly and just kind of think you can figure it out, but you know, go in there with some kind of edu education, a little bit of guidance, right? To go in there because then when you see things, it's going to resonate with you, and then you're learning, right? Yeah, no, you're spot on. I mean, that's just and like you said, reading water isn't instinct instinctual. You, it's something you has to learn. You need to understand it, you know, because people just look at a river and they see a river. Right. Um, one I used. Oh, I don't know. It was probably about a month before we were out on the San Juan during this recent trip. So I was fishing our local tailwater, and I was standing there, and I was walking out of a hole because, quite frankly, I'd caught enough fish in that, that section of the river, and I was just wanting to move. And these two guys come up, and they've got, you know, every gadget known to the fly fishing industry hanging off their vest. Um, they got bobbers, you know, the size of footballs hanging off of their lines. And the guy says, so are they biting today? And I said, yeah, they're doing real well. And I said, I was swinging a soft tackle there. I said, just run it along the edge of that seam. I said, right on the bubble line. And I said, they're laying right in there. And they both just kind of stood there and looked at me for uh, to the point that it was almost uncomfortable. <laughs> and finally, the guy said, sir, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so we had a little bit of on-stream education into what a seam was. And I you know, explained to him, I see the bubble line. Yes, okay, right there. Foam is home. All those cliches that we all know. <laughs> Um, and then the fact that I brought up a soft tackle, he really had no idea what I was talking about. And he said, well, will they hit an egg? I said, they may hit an egg, but I was hitting them on soft tackles. And he says, why were they, what do you mean soft tackles? I said, well, see those little, see those little bubbles on top of you? I said, well, those fish are fishing on, a, are feeding on a mergers. And you need to kind of mimic that to have the best success. And again, he stood there and looked at me and he said, what's an emerger? And so then we talked a little bit, and I said, well, how long have you guys been fly fishing? Oh, we, we've been at this about four or five years. <laughs> and I just <laughs> found that it was, like, indicative of a lot of the conversation we're having where people mm -hmm. don't really take the time to learn. They, I mean, I understand you just want to go fish. You get two days off a week to go fish, and you want to go fish. But there's a difference between fishing and being successful and fishing and getting a lot of casting practice. These and guys, unfortunately. And being frustrated. Oh, very frustrated or complaining about the guy that sold you the wrong color squirmy worm that day. Right. So, so but, there, but there, I think there's an underlying assumption here, though, that gear equals or gear compensates for skill, right? Gear replaces skill. And, and marketing would have you believe that, right? Uh, this is the best rod. If you buy this rod, you're going to be able to cast further, catch more fish. It's more sensitive. All these things will make you a better angler, right? So. Um, <laughs> you know, and as we know, Tenkara is kind of a, a rejection of that notion, right? It's the opposite. So, which which is kind of ironic, but um, <laughs> but you know, it's 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 the notion that skill replaces gear. You don't need gear. You don't need an indicator. You don't need a reel and line and backing and uh, all this complicated rigging, right? That's that's the idea, anyway, right? No, you're I, you're right on. I mean, that's that's the big thing is. Um... We all have a tendency to be gear junkies yep. rather than learning. Um, <laughs> it's hard not to be, though, because the gear is so sexy, you know. Yeah, it is. And you get caught up and you get yep. those you know, quick sales on the counter and stuff. <laughs> uh, I like to go back to this, you know, when we're, we're talking about learning and reading the water and learning to understand where fish and where they lie and why they're in a section of the river. Um, Yvon Chouinard had the quote, the more you, the more you know, the less you need. And I, I think I wish, I wish we could get a lot of more people to adopt that and think that through because, you know, you could, you, you can have minimal gear, which we all do, especially those of us that are, you know, our Tankara practitioners, and go to a river and be just as successful as somebody who has so much stuff that they, they have a vest and a backpack on. 
But I think the majority of the people that I've run into in Tenkara, a lot of us are, we've spent some time, we've learned water. We, when we look at a river, we can, we understand where those fish should be and why they should be there or why they're not there. Or if we see a ring and a rise, we're able to kind of analyze that and understand that, okay, no, they're not hitting top water. They're hitting the emerger right. or they're hitting, you know, pupa that are suspended in mid, in mid flow. And that's why you, you're seeing tails and, Right. Um, right. It's understanding again, it, the, the rise forms. Yeah. It, and it does take time to learn this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I just see that the trend is that there's not a lot of folks these days that are willing to take that time to learn. Yeah. Uh, because it is, I mean, I'm, you know, like you, I've been at this a while. So I've got, you know, half of a lifetime of experience behind me. And no, no, I made a lot of mistakes. I've, you know, I've ruined a lot of water by tromping through it and stopping down the bank. And, and, but over time, you learn those things. But I just see a more and more of a trend when I'm on the rivers of people where taking the time to learn the skills and the basics of fly fishing and tenkara in general, it just seems that it's going by the wayside. And now we just, everybody wants quick solutions. Well, and it's because of what you mentioned earlier, I think. You know, we live in a culture of instant gratification. I, I can order something on Amazon and have it here tomorrow, right? Um, we're, you, we're used to, you know, hyper convenience, right? And so everything, there's an app for everything. And, uh, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to learn a language because there's a translator, a real-time translator, or you don't have to, right? The, the, we, we're so used to apps like supplanting skill or knowledge that, when, when, but when it comes to fly fishing, fly fishing is a sport where you can't get an app to make you a caster, a better caster, or you can't get an app to instantly make you a better fly tire, right? So you know, there's no app for that. You've got to go through the paces and, you know, learn, learn the techniques and learn the skills. And I guess going kind of back to what I was saying before, if you just go out there and just kind of wing it and, you know, think you're going to figure it out, you, you eventually will, but it's going to take a long time. Um, and, you know, why not stand on the shoulders of giants? Like I said, there's an infinite amount of information today out there. Um, so there's no reason you can't, you know, do a little research first and kind of educate yourself before you go out there. But um, <clears throat> I was thinking <laughs> that I, I, I have this analogy I always kind of give. Um, I, I play guitar, right? And um, when I first picked up a guitar, I thought, ooh, within a week I'll be playing, you know, Jimi Hendrix solos and, you know, things like that. But it's, you know, and I just kind of, I, I figure oh, I'll teach myself, you know, and, and I, I eventually, I did teach myself, but it took a lot longer. And what, what I found is I had to unlearn a lot of mistake, a lot of bad habits that I had formed. So um, I'll use the example for uh, fly time, because everything we're saying today applies to fly time, uh, I think, as, as much as uh, fly fishing presentation. So, you know, it's kind of like, I've, I, you know, to play that Jimi Hendrix solo, I've got to go through, I've got to learn the scales, I've got to learn the notes, I've got to learn everything, right? And I've got to, I've got to learn to copy it and practice the heck out of it before I can play that solo. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen overnight. So. And so, so many people, in line with what you were saying, they're, all the questions I get are about gear. I hardly, which rod should I get? Is this line better? Is that line better? It's almost never how, oh, I, I was at this pool yesterday and I saw this happen. I didn't really understand what it was, you know, but what, you know, do you know what that could have been? Or, you know, or maybe someone sends me a video with, you know, like you said, a rise form, you know, what kind of fly is this fish taking? They don't, they don't I don't get questions like that. It's all about gear because, the industry has convinced us that gear is the most important thing, and that's what makes you a good angler, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, I you, now that you say that, I you know, as you were making that about you know the questions you're getting there are more about gear. That is that is a completely true statement. What yep. line should and I flies. buy? What, gear and what flies. What rod length do I need? What flies are they hitting on? What right. kabari flies are they hitting on? And they never um, ask, "How do I fish this fly?" They just say, "What fly?" Right. So they, they never said, well, how do I fish this? Flip? You know, yeah, or, it's rare. Or the, I, 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 they do, but I, but it's very rare. What I'm saying is it's mostly about the gear. No, that, I, you know, I, I really do. I, I sit back and I think, you know, I'm just going through my head of all the different posts and questions we've been asked. And whether it's on this site or one of the TU sites I'm on, those are typically what people ask. What line do I need? Is this mm-hmm. the right line for this rod? Um, what are they biting on today at the river? So that is, that is, I guess, driven basically by the industry, you know. Um, but, the, but the point I was uh, going to make before I got, went off on that tangent there about fly tying was, um, 
if you and I see this all the time. I'm I'm like you. I'm a member of a lot of Facebook fly tying groups, and um, I'm sure you see this all the time. Someone bought a bunch of random materials and, and some and some thread and didn't really think about it. Just bought stuff that looked good and tied it to a hook. Didn't think about proportion or size or wing. What's a wing and what's a tail and what? I mean, just kind of just randomly sl- slap stuff together, right? Now. That's, I mean, it's, I encourage inventiveness and creativity, of course, and fly tying. That's one of the greatest things about it. But <laughs> um, if you sit down the vice and you just start randomly tying stuff and wing it, like I said, like we were just talking about with presentation, first of all, you're not learning the techniques you need to tie other flies. Okay. So you're not, you're not learning the techniques that are necessary to become a good fly tire. Not only that, you're reinforcing bad habits. So you may be doing something in a weird way and you always struggle with it and you're frustrated and you can't figure out why. Well, it's because you should be doing it this way, which is a lot easier and, right? Um, so you're reinforcing now, but every time you tie a fly like that, you're getting that muscle memory, you're reinforcing that bad habit, which later down the road, if you bother to read a book or watch a video, you're going to find out, ooh, I shouldn't be doing it this way. It's better to do it this way. Now you have to unlearn that habit right so it's more work if you just go wing. you can wing it but learn some basics first right oh if you want to make up your if you want to write your own song and guitar you got to learn three chords or something you know before you can't just sit down the guitar and just start plucking strings right three, three chords and a heartbreak yeah that's all you need right well, that's all you need yeah <laughs> um no but it's interesting because you know you you bring up the subject of fly tying and that's another one of my areas where you, you see people and they're they're tying flies, and I always say we are developing into a a group of people who don't tie flies anymore. We just assemble them. Yeah, people yep. are buying. I saw that on your list too. That was brilliant. People are buying pre shaped bodies, pre shaped yep. heads, pre cut foam. Mm-hmm. You know, beads with eyes built into them. Uh, you know, the the pre dubbed threads. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, Maybe it's just my age, but I, you know, I never had any of that, so I had to learn the basics. And I've had some people who were just great because what was good about them, they, yeah, they may not have sat me down at a vice, but they would give me some instruction, and I would go tie, and they come back, and they were just like extremely critical. You know, oh, this is a great fly, and the guy would take and twist it, and all the threads would come off because mm. I didn't have the concept of thread tension right. in, in maintaining my consistent tension. Yep. That's a hard one. Or uh, example, I asked somebody one time, somebody who had been fly tying a little bit, I says, I do tie these in the round. And he kind of looked at me like I was speaking Greek. Mm-hmm. And I had explained to him what tying in the round means. Uh, and then I know we've even had discussions about this. Instead of learning to properly tie a thread and then working through or me, properly tying a fly, and if you're tying a fly, understand it. You know, you have this order of elements as you add to the fly. So people will t- go ahead and tie a fly, and they get to the end, and they realize they forgot to tie in the tail. Well, then mm-hmm. they go back yep. and try to tie the tail in on top of it, right? where they lift up the foam body, and then the solution is we're just going to add a glop of glue and hold it in place. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I see this all the time, or somebody will come up with a fly in a river, and you're they're showing me of it. And I, I mean, like you, like you said, I. I don't discourage the innovation and I don't discourage the attempt. But you're looking at this thing and you say, hey, this is a great fly. It's a it's a size 12 body, but you've got a size 2 hackle on it. Um, you try to explain the concept of proportion to yeah. them. <laughs> or, what, what, I, I want to um, go back and just highlight what you said about that. Uh, learning, like the thing you said about forgetting to tie the tails in that that's practicing the concept of order and sequence and steps, right? Which is, all, which is a kind of a sub skill of fly time that you need, right? The tail doesn't go in last. It goes in first usually, right? So you, you understanding that concept and getting familiar with that in itself is a skill. And it's something that a beginner might not think about, right? As, as a skill. They're thinking about how do I use this tool? They're, they're always focused on the tangible thing. How do I use this tool? Or how do I use this, these scissors? Or, right? But, they, but, they're not, they're, but they're not focused on these subset, these sub skills, right? Oh, no, no, you're spot on. Or, again, we go back to the tools. What's the best vice I should buy? Are these the best scissors? I, I need to buy hooks. What are the best hooks available? Um, Rather than, hey, when I tie my flies, when I get done my, as I go to tie my hackle in, 
it's spinning off center. What am I doing wrong? And those are the questions that people should be asking. Right. Or you, you, you get a fly and you look at it and the hackle's all pulled off to one side when they, when they tied it in. Yeah. Or they've either whip finished a quarter inch back from the eye or you can't find the eye. I mean, granted, that's a skill that takes time. What, what is it often said? You don't, you don't really know how to tie a fly until you've tied 10,000 of them or something along that. I can't uh, remember. Well, Jeff, there's, a, uh, there's a kind of saying about you need 10,000 hours of practice to ma master anything. So, I mean, um, I tied flies for years and I even took, you know, my hand up for a while or tying professionally, you know, for fly shops or, um, you know, tying for orders. Like when I was in Alaska, I used to tie all the time, a lot of streamer flies for those. And I very quickly learned that I did not want to do that for a job. <laughs> Right, right. Oh, no. no. Because, I mean, you tie and you, you know, you sell your flies, but when you sit and got to tie 12 dozen of the exact same fly yeah. in the exact same color, in the exact same pattern, yeah, you talk about mundane. That it's is maddening. patience to the utmost. Yes, it's, ma it's maddening. But People I don't that is where you gain skills. <laughs> People don't appreciate how many six dozen really is until you have to actually, you know, tie, you know, six dozen of the same thing over and over, yeah. Um, but, you know, I wanted to bring up uh, yesterday, my daughter was here and she asked me if she could tie some flies. And, um, of course, you know, I, um, I encourage her to, to, to do it. Um, she doesn't have the greatest attention span, but we were able to finish a couple of flies. But um, anyway, she wanted to sit down and just kind of grab. She saw a bunch of pink feathers and, you know, I think it was schlopping and some spay hackle. And I mean, just things that were completely inappropriate. But, you know, they were bright, flashy colors and that's what she wanted to use. But I kind of tried to get her rein it in and say, okay, well, here's a selection of materials that um, you can choose from that will still, still catch a fish if you tie a fly with it. Um, but, you know, you still have some control over your own creativity. So, you know, choose from this. So you get to pick it and you're creating it, right? And so she came up with basically just a soft tackle. Uh, for those of you listening to the audio-only version of this, you won't be able to see it, but I'm holding up uh, her fly. And it's just a, a, a simple soft tackle, okay? But with this fly, she learned how to uh, keep its thread tension, as you were just saying. <laughs> thread tension is the number one thing fly t beginning fly tires struggle with. Um, and I, you know, it's always right at the end. They just let go of that thread and everything unwinds. You know, you've, you've seen that. So, but she learned thread control and, and tension. She learned uh, how to leave, not crowd the eye, like you were just talking about. Um, so to leave a little room at the eye. She learned the concept of, of wrapping away from her. She, her tendency was to wrap just wh whichever way she wanted, right? You know, toward her one time, the, uh, away at Latin next. So she got familiar her muscle memory is developing to wrap away, right? Always away. Okay. And, and she learned how to do a half hitch tool. Okay. So just with this simple little fly and this fly, will catch a fish with this simple little pattern, just because I gave her a little guidance, uh, she was able to practice all those techniques. The next one we tie will be better than this. And she'll have hopefully retain those things. Right. So it, she didn't have to sit down and read a 400 page book or listen to 12 hours of YouTube video, just with a little guidance. She, she was able to come up with something that she still created, but will actually catch a fish. Okay. Well, so now she remembers those te techniques. Now, if you just sit, and so my, this is going back to my point earlier. If you just sit down and just buy a bunch of random materials and just lack them on, uh, lash them on the hook, it's masturbatory. You're not learning anything and you're probably going to end up with a fly that mm, probably isn't going to catch a fish. So. Well, you, you, you're, yeah, you're right there because, you know, again, this whole conversation, you were talking about learning the basics of things. And it's really, it comes down to learning the basics of fly time. So you, you, you're gearing her towards tying a simple pattern that teaches the common techniques that will be used for all fly time. I mean, when you teach a lot of classes, you teach somebody initially to tie a basic woolly booger. Yep. You know, it teaches them how to thread, you know, wrap the thread in the body. You tie in the tail. Mm -hmm. You'd be able to, to tie the, you know, hail, uh, hackle in get your wraps, get your distance. Then you maybe you move on to something like a soft tackle, <clears throat> then maybe into a nymph pattern before you really attack a dry fly. But <clears throat> you see people that I, a lot of times, will tie two or three woolly boogers and they're completely out of proportion, different color. And then the next thing you know, they're trying to tie a royal wolf. <laughs> and they can't figure out why they can't catch fish because the, you know, the wings on the thing are three inches long on a size 14. <laughs> Um, 
But that's really what it comes down to is learning the, the basics of that and tying those simple patterns. Uh, many times I've asked people the same as you were referring to, they're buying tying materials and they say, what fly should I learn how to tie? Or I want to tie this fly. But, and I always try to iterate to them, learn the basics first. Take a little bit of time and understand, you know, how you wrap the thread on the body, how you start it, why you put half hitches and maybe, you know, interspersed within the body if you're changing materials and you're going to have a pause. Um, why, if you're going to underweight a fly, where you weight it within the fly, and why you do that. If you learn all those basics, you really can tie any pattern because then you're gaining the knowledge of how they're put on the hook and how they're, you know, tied in. But then you're also learning the order of operations and tying the fly. Because I guarantee you, you or I, somebody can hand us a fly that we've never seen before, and it, you start looking at it, and your brain is dissecting it, how you tied this in. Yeah, we can read the question. You may have a like, well, I like how, you, how did you put that in there versus this? <laughs> because that's because we've taken the time over a period of years or practice to learn the basics. And this goes back to this whole conversation. People need to learn to tie to learn the basics, whether it's tankara, whether it's fly fishing, or whether it's tying flies. Because as we said, a lot of people want to buy a foam cut body, throw it on a hook, throw some glue down, wrap four or five wraps of thread on it, throw tie in some rubber legs, which are uneven, and then go try to catch fish with it and can't understand why they can't catch fish with it. Right. Right. And um, in a way, Chuck, I think um, it might seem counterintuitive, but in a way, I think learning the basic basics actually gives you more freedom for creativity. For, for example, if you're a beginner fly tire and you sit down and say, okay, I want to, I have this idea of a fly in my mind, right? I want to make it look this way. Okay, I get to a certain point. I say, oh, I want the wing to do that or the tail to do that. Ah, but I don't know how to do that because I never learned that basic skill, right? So it may prevent you from being more creative with your fly time because you want to make the fly look a certain way. You don't know how. If, if you do. But if you learn, if you know those basics, you already know how. And, and so when you think of a fly, so you start creating your own patterns, um, you already know how to tie them, right? It's just choosing which material is going to add and how you want to make it look. No, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, it really is because it's, it's like anything. If you learn, you learn those basic skills and then you just learn how to apply those. You know, there's knowledge level learning, comprehension level learning. That's into the comprehensive level of learning where you've learned the basics, you understand the score functions, and then you can apply those into a given situation. Um, and that, I, I don't that's know. That's just I, like guitar. That's just like guitar or any example. If you know the scales, you can play any song, right? You can play any solo you want. Same thing. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we've become this kind of this drift where you want to buy a pre-made egg body, slide it on the hook, throw in a drop of glue and call it an egg pattern. Or, you know, the squirmy worm, you buy the rubber body, you cut off a section, you yep. tie it on. The ever-dreaded mop fly in my, my vernacular. <laughs> you right. know, I'm going to go buy a mop, wrap it on a hook and call it a fly. I don't know. I, I guess I shudder because I've always learned in, in fish with the more natural appearing flies. Um, I was just going to say that, Chuck. Um, not only is, is are so many materials prefab and you assemble them or glue them. Uh, but everything's synthetic today, you know, uh, synthetic uh, quills, you've got synthetic uh, yarn and hair. I mean, every synthetic dubbing with all kinds of flash. And I mean, everything's synthetic, you know, there are people out there who probably have never felt, you know, actual uh, peacock hurl run through their fingertips, you know, because they, they just use the synthetic dubbing instead because it's easier or something. Um, so if you ask certain people, you know, the, the properties of different materials, they don't know them, right? When should I use mole dubbing versus squirrel dubbing, right? Uh, or beaver dubbing, right? Versus, uh, you know, a possum or something. So, you know, again, that, that there's just a lack of understanding of the, of the basic materials that, uh, that are common to so many uh, fly patterns. And, and that's circumvented by the synthetics, right? Oh yeah, it's you know you go to the you go to the fly tying shop right now, and you've got an entire wall, like I said, of synthetic materials of some sort. Right. You know, I bought something a number of years ago when I was trying to tie some saltwater patterns, and it was this. Uh, basically, it was like flashaboo that had been dubbed into thread on wire, you know, a wire brush. <laughs> yeah, I, I've and, seen this. Yeah. And that's why I, I tied some saltwater patterns with it, and I don't know, it just. 
It just didn't feel like a fly to me. <laughs> it felt yeah. like I was tying a lure <laughs> versus tying a fly. Yeah. I'm not anti-synthetic. I tie I tie with synthetics, but sparingly. I don't. I, I, I just to me when I look at a fly and it's if it's a hundred percent synthetic or pre, I just like that. It's just ugly to me. I, I you know. Um, I don't know. CDC is beautiful, and you know, squirrel dubbing with its spikiness and everything. It's, it's beautiful, right? And peacock with its natural iridescence is beautiful, you know. And I don't know. I just I enjoy tying with natural materials, but my, I guess my point is not synthetic versus natural my point is more about if you focus mostly on these prefab materials or the synthetic materials and stuff like that you never learn again a sub skill this is not a hard skill but it's another sub skill kind of like learning order and sequence you learn properties of common materials right how, how do you make peacock hurl stronger right because you don't have to think about that. If you just use synthetic peacock dubbing, you don't have to think about it. You just wrap it, and it's going to last 10,000 years, right? Because it's plastic. So, um, But, you know, if you work with the natural stuff, you, you want to reinforce it and make it stronger, or wrap it different ways, right? But you never learn those properties, right, if you only focus, if you just learn. So my, my, I guess my point would be, uh, you know, learn both. <laughs> Become familiar with both, the properties of all different kinds of materials, right? And, and don't just ignore the, the, the classic materials because those are important because one day you're going to run up against a pattern where you have to use the natural. Maybe there's no synthetic for that, right? So you're going to have to start, you know, it's good to have a basic working knowledge of the common materials of flying time. Yeah. And then like I said, how to apply them, where do they apply? What, what action are you trying to impart in that fly when it's in the water? I mean, these are advanced skills that take time to learn. Um, but again, if you don't learn that from the basics of understanding these and in how you use these and you always just jump into the synthetics, uh, the, the pre-made fly tying, you know, you, you never really learn those things. Right. I mean, I've, I've run into people who really didn't understand how to just do a simple dubbing loop. I mean, that was one of the core things I learned. I mean, and I learned where, where I use a dubbing loop and where I don't use a dubbing loop on a, on a particular fly. But now I, Seen the other day, and I, I I saw pre pre dubbed threads, and I was just perplexed. Um, because yeah, I dubbing like little ropes, like little dubbing ropes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, yep. wow. Brushes. Of course, I want to know who in the world is. People are sitting there for hours at a time as a as a business are dubbing threads and then putting them <laughs> on a spool. And there's a yeah. job for you right there, you know. Yeah. Um, as we you know we're talking about all these things, we're talking about like I said, we we refer this back to just learning the basic skills involved with fishing and tenkara fishing and even conventional fly fishing. You know, we, we talked a little bit about reading water and understanding your fishing situation and why you should fish where you fish and why you don't walk through the hole and turn around and fish it. And we talked about fly fishing. But this even gets into the area for me and one of my particular things that just bugs the heck out of me is casting. Um, we see it all the time. We see questions. How do you cast a level line? I use a furrow line because it's easier to cast. Um, and this is even carries over into just conventional fly fishing. I see people on the river who, whose casting just makes me cringe. Because let's be real, in tenkara fishing and conventional fly fishing, the, the core skill that you need to learn to have any level of success is how to cast. Yep. <laughs> and, and, no and, way and around people, that. And people want to think if they're in conventional fly fishermen, they think if they go out and spend just – you know, a month's worth of salary on a twelve or fifteen hundred dollar Helios rod, and all of a sudden they're going to be able to cast. Well, no, you you don't need a fifteen hundred dollar rod. You need a fifty dollar casting lesson. Yes, but that gets into that that common core of learning the basics of fly fishing or tenkara fishing, and learning to do that with some level of skill because that is really going to dictate your success from everything else down the road. Uh, because you can learn to read the water. You can understand that, okay, in that pool right there, that is a complete prime lie. There should be fish in it, but I can't get a fly in it because I can't cast. Mm. Um, it, and really, casting is the number one thing. Everybody wants to go fishing, but nobody wants to practice their casting. That's right. Uh, last night, I was listening to a podcast um, on Ask About Fly Fishing, and they were interviewing Gary Borger, and they were talking about casting. You know, and Gary is just one of those people who have just you know made casting a science him and his son yeah. jason they've dissected this and, and that's what he said 
um, when you're going to practice casting, you don't go fishing. You should practice your casting. And if you can't cast well, you really can't fish. But that's, again, going back, as we were saying, to the basics. Learn to do that. Learn to do that fairly well, and you're just increasing your ability to have success on the river or lake or wherever you may have to be fishing. Right. It's going to increase your overall enjoyment. Uh, and it's all, and again, we're always, I'm always uh, trying to help beginners reduce frustration. And if you can cast better, you're not going to get snagged as much. You're not going to get caught in the tree as much. You're not going to hook your ear as much, right? So you're, 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 it's just going to be a less frustrating experience. Um, and you're probably going to catch way more fish if you uh, put a little practice into it first, right? Well, even when we were on the San Juan, there was the one gentleman that was with us, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't think I remember his name, but um, when we all had waded into the lower flats area and he was fishing down below us, me and Dave Knoll were watching him fish, and, and his casting really needed help. And Dave, That might have been me, Chuck. No, I wasn't. <laughs> you, you, you were over to the side. We were keeping an eye on you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and, and Dave says, you know, should I go over and see if I can give him a hand? And I said, well, let's watch him a little bit. And then finally, so we kind of both migrated downriver and, you know, very cautiously. We said, hey, can we give you a, show you a couple things here? Because you're doing just a couple things wrong that is ruining your cast. So we spent 10 minutes with him. And, you know, it was funny. He got done. He says, you know, nobody's ever stopped and taken time to show me this before. Uh, and really what it was, he just was breaking his wrist and tipping his arm too far back. He he really was trying to use a conventional fly cast with a 10-car rod. And he really wasn't even good at a conventional fly cast. But after a few minutes, he had kind of picked it up. Um, but again, he goes back. He said nobody had ever taken the time and never shown him that. And I think, you know, out of all this, when we're talking about all these things, I, I think those of us that have skills or have, have learned these over time, I think we really kind of have a responsibility, at least I try to, to help those who don't learn. Because at some point in time, somebody helped us. Exactly. You know? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> you know. And that so. little anecdote you just uh, said, I, 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 again, it goes right back to uh, my example with my daughter, too. It just takes a, just a little guidance. Can open up a whole, you know, new world for you, right? So it doesn't have, you don't have to sit down and study like it's a PhD or something, but just a little help from someone in the know, uh, as Chuck said, or, you know, just a little research can, can really just go a long way. So I think um, earlier, you know, you kind of mentioned people, uh, tr you know, trying to get into fly fishing for the first time and some of their perceptions about it. And, you know, one thing I always hear is it's, it's too hard. It's, it's, that you have to, it takes years to master. It's difficult. It's frustrating. Only certain people can do it. I've heard that one. Um, you know, so, but I, I think, and, and that's for a lot of people, that's a barrier to entry. Okay. Not just the cost, but, you know, the, also the, they're intimidated by this, you know, idea that you have to pr earn a PhD to fly fish. So I think realizing though, you know, you've just heard two examples, right? Where just a, a little guid guidance um, helped immensely. Um, so it doesn't take much, but, you know, it's and any advice you can get from uh, people on, on Facebook or anywhere, um, you know, can, can really, really improve your learning curve a lot instead of just going out there and, and, wing, and uh, winging it. Yeah, no, true. I mean, even as long as I've been doing this, um, you know, last year we both were at the Oni Tenkara School out there in South uh, Ogden. And. So I went there and I watched Oni walk a section of river. And by just standing there and observing and watching him pick a stream apart, I learned things because, uh, um, I mean, he just dissects it, you know. And so I say even somebody who's been at it as long as I have and you have and all those others that were in that class, uh, there's still lessons to be to oh, learned. Yeah. You really don't ever know anything. No. And every now and then, we all have to go back and revisit the basics because we get caught up sometimes in, in a lot of the, the hype. I mean, yeah, we, uh, you know, a lot of our conversations that we all have online, those of us have been practicing Tenkar for years, we talk a lot about rods. <laughs> yeah, right. it's hard <laughs> we, not to, right? But we, we really do, <laughs> you know. But at the end of the day, we're all able to take a rod out and evaluate it and cast it and then be able to, uh, you know, ascertain whether that rod is going to work for us simply because we all understand the basics of casting. We're all pretty proficient to add it. But again, that takes time to learn, but we've all taken the time to learn that. 
And yeah, I just see too many people who won't take the time to learn that and will go out and just flail the water. Um, and like I said, the next thing you know, you see on some website that their rods are for sale. I tried Tenkara. It's just not for me. I can't cast this thing. I got a fly rod. I can't cast this thing. But it's really just an absolutely fantastic sport. You just got to take some time and learn the basics and stay at it. Yeah. But when, when people say, I can't cast this thing, I think what they're really saying is, I don't want to commit any time to learning how to cast this thing. That's, oh, that's, that's what that's, it sounds like to me. It's not a high enough priority for me to invest my, enough time in it you know, to learn it. That's kind of what I hear. Instant gratification. Instant <laughs> you said gratification. that earlier in the cast. Instant right. gratification. Right. Well, I, I example, let one last lady out here. I was with this guy fishing, and I was watching him on the river, and he's down below me, and I'm watching this guy cast, and it's just, he just, he, it's just not working. And he goes, I just can't get this rod to work for me. And I go up, and I said, well, I don't know it. I said, do you mind if I try it? So I, I pick up the rod, and I, I cast, and yeah, I was able to cast the rod, but there was just something odd about it. And I said, how long have you had this? Oh. I got it a couple months ago for Christmas, and I went down to, you know, XX big box store, and I had a guy there help me rig it up, and I come out here fishing, he goes, and this thing just won't cast for me, and I don't know what, what drove me to think about this, so I started running my fingers along the line, and at that point in time, I realized they had put the line backwards on the reel. Mm-hmm, I've seen that. <laughs> so, so the I backing, stopped. so, so, so uh, I'm assuming it was a weight forward line? Yep. <laughs> okay, right. So the, the, the weight forward part was on the attached to the backing and the running line, the thin running line, which is not very castable. Um, okay, that's, that's interesting. I've actually seen that. Yeah, but again, this goes back to the person in the big box store who sold him to set this up, understanding that tapered lines are tapered and mm -hmm. there is a direction to go. And usually they got a little sticker that says, this end to real. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So we stopped midstream. I helped him. We flipped this line around, put it back in, cast, uh, and things worked much better for the gentleman. I spent a few minutes helping him with his cast, and then he went on his way. And I watched him throughout the day, and he, he was doing well, and he was actually catching some fish. But again, that was, that was you know, understanding it how these components go together, that goes back to the basics of just setting up your equipment and understanding some of the fundamentals before you go to river and walk away and, you know, throw the rod in the back of the truck and say, I don't ever want to do this again. So. Right. And I think um, also practicing ahead of time, whether it's your casting or your knots or um, whatever, I think practicing at home in the backyard for 15 minutes a night or whatever, just, or, you know, sitting down, uh, tie a knot, you know, tie some knots on your lunch break at work or something, just to start getting that, again, that muscle memory and getting into the habit and, um, and changing your intuition, right? Training your intuition. All that can help because when you get on the water, you don't want to waste your valuable fishing time struggling for 10 minutes to tie one knot, right? Wouldn't it be better if you had practiced that for a couple of weeks at work uh, and now you get out there and you can tie a knot, no problem, get right to the fish, right? So... I, I think it just makes the on the on stream experience better if you practice at home a little bit. Yeah, that goes back to what you're saying. Spending your time, investing a little bit of your time and resources into to learning those common things that will improve your fishing time and your on stream water time much more, you know. Yeah. Like I said, casting. Fifteen minutes once or twice a week for probably three weeks. Um I guarantee you when you hit the river, you'll be much more successful. Whether you're casting an Oni type one or you're casting a nine foot five weight. Right. Um, because when, when you're fishing, you're, you're focused on fishing. You're not focused on casting. Um, you know, and you, you've seen people, you've watched them practice cast, or you've spent some time teaching them the basics. And then when they get to the river and the first time they get a, a fish that rises or a fish that taps their line, um, their, their knowledge of casting goes out the door immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they get the excited. Five, and, yeah. yeah. The next <laughs> five casts are just, okay, wait, slow down, take a breath. Uh, remember what we talked about. Let's go back at this again. And then, you know, things go back to where they should be. But again, it's it's the investment in the time, taking the time to learn the basics, maybe doing a little research. And if you're really going to do something, you need to invest some some level of your ambition to doing this. Yeah, and, and that, that's a great point. That It really comes down to how much of a priority is it for you, right? Anyone can learn fly fishing. Anyone can learn Tenkara. Obviously, you know, Hundreds of thousands of people have, right? So, um, so obviously it's learnable. 
But the question is, you know, are you going to commit to it? You have to commit a little time to it, right? Uh, a little practice, like any, like any endeavor, right? It doesn't matter if it's golf, guitar, it doesn't matter. You have to invest some uh, level of time into it. So it's, it's a matter of priority, right? So um, I wanted to pass an idea to you and see, see what you think about it. Um, before, uh, before we hit record, I was kind of thinking about this and just jotted this down. Um, I was, you know, thinking specifically about Tenkara and thinking about everything we're talking about right now, how, uh, you know, people are kind of circumventing skills with, with gear and, and uh, trying to take shortcuts and things like that. Um, I, I'm wondering, it seems to me, uh, a lot of people come to Tenkara because it's simpler. Uh, I, and I, I know you've heard this a lot too. A lot of people have told me, you know, fly fishing is just too intimidating. Uh, Tenkara looks a lot easier, a lot more approachable, uh, and you know, maybe easier to learn. Uh, there's less gear, so it's there's not much a, that not mm-hmm. not as much of a financial investment. Um, so I'm thinking, <laughs> in 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 the conventional fly fishing industry, uh, gear has kind of replaced skill. That's what the marketers want want us to believe. So when people come to Tenkara, there's less gear, okay? And so I wonder if there's this, this kind of like subconscious perception that because there's less gear, there's less to learn. And, and so maybe people think there isn't as much of an investment in Tenkara as there would be in conventional fly fishing, for example. What do you think about that? That's, a, that's an interesting perspective. I guess I've never really thought about it that way because... I've always looked at Tenkara, again, I go back to that, the more you know, the less you need. You know, and we all talk about Tenkara being simple and there's less equipment. But in that fact, I've always regarded that is then that throws more of the reliance of understanding what I'm doing and how to apply those techniques, whether I'm using a manipulation technique on a kabari that I'm running through a hole or to understand why I should cast a certain section of the stream. So. I've always looked at Tenkara is that it forces me to have to learn more about what I'm doing to be successful because I am self-limiting myself and I'm not using a store-bought solution for every section of the river. But I think that maybe that maybe that is it. I think you could be onto something where people think it is so simple. They don't really need to take all this time to go learn all this additional material. You just, you know, take take a rod, tap your line on, tie on any version of a fly, go out and cast, um, and then question why you're not catching any fish anywhere. Uh, yeah, you really could be onto something with that. I mean, that's kind of the reverse concept, but... Um, well, it's ironic, because as you just said, I mean, and what you're saying, it, that's just not, I don't think, a personal opinion. That's one of the, the tenets of Tenkara, right? As the party line goes, right? That you rely more on your skill than your gear. That's the party line. So... Um, it's ironic that people would think there's less to learn because there's less gear when Tenkara tells you it, we're going to focus on skill rather than gear, right? Is, do you see the irony there, right? So it's, yeah, that, that, it's just that, interesting that, to a, me. You know? that, that's a conundrum right there. I think that's an interesting because really can, you could you can go both ways with that that whole perspective. But yeah, it's uh, I know a lot of folks they do they just they want to do it because it's so simple. And I say, yeah, I, I don't like regular fly fishing because I didn't want it to deal with the gear and learning how to rig all that up and, you know, all the different flies and stuff. I just take a 10 car rod and I just tie on one fly and I go fish. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You have one fly. You have to go fish with that, but that throws a lot of the onus on success on you understanding those sections of those rivers and fish behavior and being able to somewhat have knowledge of a rise form and why you should make your, your fly or kabari do X versus just dead drifting it through a hole. But again, that's that's understanding it and learning the basics of it and understanding the background of what you're doing and being able to put all those components together. So right. um, I don't know, maybe sometimes the marketing on Tenkara being so simple and being easy to learn maybe is having, you know, the opposite effect of what it really should. I, mean, I was just going to say that. Of that. I was just going to say that. I, th- I think it's been taken too far. Um, you know, my friend Chris had until recently a hundred Tenkara rods, right? Yes. So you know, we're, we're definitely gear junkies. It's supposed to be simple. I, I think that it's important to make a distinction between the fact of, um, it's Tenkara is simple when it's simple on the water, right? It's simple on the water. 
But at home in your garage, you might have 50 rods and, you know, 30 spools and tons of fly boxes and line. But on the water, what you use in, 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 the, in fishing is simple, right? And I think that's kind of an important distinction. Uh, just, just because you're, you, own, uh, you own tons of gear doesn't mean that you're kind of, you know, overcomplicating it, right? Because on the river, you're just using one rod and a line and a fly, right? So, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think it is. In, it, Tankara is a very, it's a very interesting case and it's a very unique case because you can get away with very little. You can get away with just a, a, a very simple fly with a thread body and one hackle and a line and, you know, and, and you can keep it simple or you can go the opposite direction and make it very complicated if you want. But to me, that's always been one of the great things about fly fishing in general. There, there are all levels of it that yeah, in which you can participate, right? So you, you could just keep it really simple and basic and have a casual knowledge of things, or you can get a degree in entomology and be able to in, uh, identify every <laughs> insect on the stream by their Latin classification and, you know, uh, just, you know, really uh, delve into it, right? And everyone in between. So the level at which you participate is up to you. But there's that doesn't mean that there's, there's, no, com there's no time commitment to it and that you can just, right, just, you still have to learn some level of basics, even if you want to take it at the most casual level, I think. So, yeah, if you want to have any level of success, you really need to go learn some, some, some core things. Right. Um, and I, I just see there's this trend where people don't want to take the time to learn those core anymore. And I understand everybody's pressed for time. And, you know, you, you get to fish one weekend a month. The rest of the time you're involved with the wife and the family and your kids and your house and your job. Um, and you just want to go out there and you just want to catch fish. So you'll run to the local big box store, buy the most current color of squirmy worm and go out to the river and tie it on it. And hopefully you're going to catch some fish. So I, I get that. I mean, there, that's just reality of life. But if, if you want to move beyond that and you really want to become a better fisher, you, you need to spend, you know, and it doesn't take a tremendous amount of time, but you at least need to understand those core elements of Understanding fish behavior to the, to, to the to the minuscule degree can improve your fishing. You, you know why when you go fishing and it's ninety eight degrees out, um, why you should not be fishing that big pool, why you should be fishing at the tail end of that riffle, <laughs> if you understand common fish behavior or even just basic behavior. But that that's taking the time to learn some of the basics. You know, what do fish needs to survive? Food, oxygen, security. Um, that riffle, that big pool, why it may give them food. There's no oxygen. Um, there may be some security there, but it's 98 degrees and the water's too warm and it's going to threaten them. So you need to move down to that riffle because at least there's you know more oxygenated water. And, and the reason I brought that up is because I've actually had that conversation with somebody on the river mm -hmm. before. And they were questioning why I was catching fish and they weren't. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just understanding the basics and that's spending some time and learning those things to it. And like I said, you don't have to have the PhD. Uh, sometimes it's simple as reading one little simple book or, you know, reading something online about fish behavior that'll drive your success when you get onto the river. And I just see there's this ever evolving trend where uh, people much below my age um, who really don't want to spend that time and effort to learn those cores, whether it's tying a fly and learning how to manage your thread control when you tie a fly, getting the proportion right to the body, whether it's learning why fish are holding in a certain part of a river or even learning how to properly cast a tenkara rod. It's right. just, it, I just see these are gaps in the sport, or at least a wide, wide ranges on both ends of the scale. So, Right. And, and again, just to reinforce what I said before, I think it's symptomatic of our culture. But uh, anyway, um, before we talk a little bit about how people can uh, learn all of this stuff, right, and resources, uh, first, I, I just kind of want to say something uh, that I'm, I'm sure you've had this experience too. Um, I see it all the time. Someone asks a question on Facebook. They're a beginner. And it doesn't matter if it's tying, fly tying or just a general uh, fly fishing question. But, you know, it'll be, the, the question is just it's so, you know, I want to start fly fishing. What rod should I get? Okay. <laughs> that, that, that's kind of like asking, how do I fly an airplane? You know, please answer this within a Facebook comment. Okay. So, I mean, the, 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 probably the, the most important piece of advice I can give anyone who's interested in using, uh, you know, social media or uh, just any online resource to, to learn more about fly fishing or tankara, um, ask questions, okay, on, on the groups and forums or wherever. Ask questions, but give as much detail as you can, 
I, every time I see this is a super vague question and then all they get 50 comments, all of them are irrelevant because they find out, oh, well, he's talking about bass, not trout, or he's talking about this, not that, right? People made all these assumptions because it was so vague. So basically all that information was irre irrelevant to the original poster's question. Everyone just wasted a bunch of time and the, the original poster didn't learn anything. They didn't get their question answered. So please be as specific as you can if you're gonna ask a question. Hey, I'm thinking about getting into fly fishing, or Tenkara. Um, I live in Maryland, and the, these are the types of streams I fish. These are the kinds of fish I catch. Um, you know, these give us some detail that to work with, so we can get recommend gear for you, point you into different resources. Oh, there's a guide in your area. Let me send you a link. Uh, here's a great book on that. Right. So, um, give as much detail as you can. Vague questions will get you nowhere, and it's probably just going to confuse you. To be honest with you. No, that's a good point. Like you said, I see it all the time. I want to get in a tank car. What rod should I buy? What's the best okay. line? <laughs> For what? <laughs> hey, babe, what's your sign? Okay, there's the best line. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, that's what I put the other day. It's like opening up that can of worms because you're going to get, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Some, sometimes the answers themselves are hilarious. But <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The comments are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, and I think there's a lot of us out there that are willing to help folks, you know, and, and provide some of the lessons learned that we, we've given because we, we've went through some of these pains and growing pains to learn this stuff and we're willing to share it. But yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on with that. It's, uh, <laughs> or at least, at least, at least tell us what region of the country you're in so we can make some right. reasonable assumptions. So the, the majority of the Tenkara community and fly fishing communities are extremely helpful and they want to help. They love to help people. Um, but you got to ask the right questions. That's all. And um, so, you know, it's it, Tenkara, especially because we're su such a small, tight knit community, it's very intimate. Uh, people are very, very helpful, they're very generous with their time. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask a question. Uh, another thing I would say is before you ask a question, Google it first. Google is your best friend. Any question you have, Google it first, just so you see if you can get to pick up some background information uh, to you before you, you ask a question. But so uh, obviously Google is a great resource, but um, Chuck, you actually had some kind of a little bit more specific resources. So let's talk about, okay, this is all well and good, right? If I'm a beginner, uh, you know, I, I, I should probably get a little guidance before I go out there and not just kind of make stuff up as I go along. Uh, okay, well, how do I do that? How do I educate myself? Where should I look for these resources? Um, one thing I want to say is on my website, tenkaratalk.com, I've got a, a links page. So I've got links for everything there. Um, so uh, all kinds of other websites, books, um, guide services, uh, videos, all kinds of things. So definitely check out the guide or the uh, links page on tenkaratalk.com. Uh, but Chuck, what, what resources would you recommend for people who are kind of maybe, again, they don't want to delve in and get the PhD, but they want, they want to learn, they want to get a solid foundation for the basics. What should they be looking at? Well, in addition to what, what you're talking about, the online resources, I mean, your website is just a tremendous amount of resources. Uh, Tenkara USA has a tremendous amount of videos. Uh, and some of them are very, very yep. well done. Um, and there's a lot of other fishers out there in the Tenkara world who have posted sites out there and pages and they're showing fishing. And a lot of these folks really explain what they're doing on the river and why they're doing it. So I, I ask people to take advantage of those. Um, and I understand trying to use like your local resources like Trout Unlimited chapters or fishing clubs and those, a lot of times those are very focused on conventional fly fishing and not so much on Tenkara. But some of those different groups offer programs about stream entomology and fish behavior and those type of things, so that, that helps you learn. But I go back to the old days when you wanted to learn stuff, you read books. <laughs> you know, uh, what I like about a book is you can go back to it and download it to a Kindle. It really doesn't matter. Um, and some of these you can get to the library. Some of them you can just Kindle borrow. So I've listed a few books. There's just some of the basics, and I'll add one in there that, I don't know, I think are core reading if you really want to try to gain some knowledge of this sport and to be have some level of success. When it comes to Tenkara, the very first one I'm going to I'm going to say is the book Tenkara by Tenkara USA, written by Daniel. Yep. If you want to get into Tenkara, go buy that book. It really is a you know start to finish the basics of how Tenkara works, 
how you fish it, explains a lot about lines, about how, how the Kabari were developed, how to cast. It is a really good fundamental book. I think every, every Tenkara fisherman should probably have that in their library. Absolutely. And uh, that book, it, it also, I should mention, has QR codes that uh, take you to videos that correspond to uh, what you're reading in the book. It's, it's a very, very good, comprehensive book. Um, then the other ones I get into, we talk about reading water. Uh, Dave Hughes wrote a book called Reading Trout Water. It's a simple book, a quick little read, packed with information. Um, it's literally, it's one of those books that kind of breaks a stream down into different pieces of you, but it relates to fish behavior to you. Uh, so that, that's a good one to have in your library. Tom Rosenbauer, The Orvis Guide to Prospecting for Trout. Uh, granted, that's written from a conventional fly fishing perspective. But it really doesn't matter because the fish behavior and where they are within a section of river, stream, or creek doesn't change depending on the method right. you're using to fish Excellent for them. Book. Excellent book. Uh, Rick Osthoff, who's up out of Wisconsin, uh, has a book called No Hatch to Match. It is, it's a small book. Um, and what's nice about it, he, he, he doesn't really get into specific fly patterns. Like he talks about these patterns within his book, but they are all – very much, very well dovetail right into Tenkara because they're generic patterns. And by using manipulation techniques within the stream, he, he tells you how to catch fish when there's no surface activity. You hmm. don't see rises and you don't see flashes and how you can go about these. And he talks about using, you know, like, you know taking a, what he calls a soft woolly worm, which is basically a short woolly booger, and being able to ma manipulate that in the stream to generate, you know, reaction strikes. And so that's a real quick book. It's yeah, one of those that's one. sort of overlooked because he's not the, you know, the big name author, but it's a fantastic book. Yeah. Uh, um, Dave Whitlock, Trout and Their Food. Um, if you really want to learn why fish feed and how they feed, that is a really good book. I, I was fortunate here. Dave Whitlock lived in Oklahoma for a number of years on and off, and I've got to meet him multiple times. And this book in particular is a lot of the summation of articles that he would write in like the back of Trout Magazine and some others. And it's not as detailed as his, his big book, Trout and Their, Their Foods, which is like getting a PhD level in entomology. This one's a little short. It's a lot of quick stories. Um, it tells you why trout feed on a damselfly, how you can represent a damselfly within the water. Great book, easy to read, lots of pictures, things like that. But it's a very basic Sheraton Anderson, the Curtis Creek Manifesto. Yeah, it's good. Book. If you are something who's somebody who's beginning into the world of fly fishing or ten car fishing, um, yes, it's written in almost comic book form, but it is a fantastic book because it it really simplifies everything right down to the core principles. And it's one of those as my nieces who fly fish and they both love it. I bought them that book when they were kids, and they still have it to this day. And they actually go back and re occasionally refer to it. So. Um, and then the the last one that I was going to bring up um, was the book that uh, Yvonne Chenard did, uh, Simple mm -hmm. Fly Fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, and granted, it's written somewhere between the line between conventional fly fishing and Tenkara. But the concept of that book is to keep things simple. Don't overcomplicate them. They focus on the core principles and understanding why you fish and where you fish. Um, and that's one of those you you go back to every now and refer. Plus, it's just got some great fly patterns in it if you're a tire. So. Right. But those are just my suggestions for common books. And I think people, if you really want to learn this sport, uh, but you don't want to waste time filtering through the hundreds of thousands of books that are out there in the fly fishing industry, these are ones here that are really kind of just common sense and get right to the subject matter very quickly. No, those are all great recommendations. I want to plug a few things here. Um, one is... Um, the Discover Tenkara online course. Obviously, this is uh, specifically for Tenkara, but uh, this this is a great course. I've gone through it myself. Um, it's got lots of videos from actual uh, Japanese uh, anglers, um, uh, some some <laughs> pretty big names in, in Japan. But it's got great video. Um, if if you know anything about Discover Tenkara, they've got really high quality video. Um, and they've, I think there's uh, 10 hours or something like that in the course, but it's, it's really, really good. Um, lots of information broken down in a very logical uh, uh, way, um, short kind of digestible uh, chapters. It's not this like taxing course, like, you know, uh, like homework or something like that. It's actually kind of a, a fun course to take. So anyway, um, great course. Um, also, um, hire a guide. 
you, you will, if you hire a guide, you will learn so much in one day. Um, I mean, it, it'll save you hours and hours and hours and hours of frustration. I mean, it's, it, I, I just really can't stress how valuable that is. Um, and if, uh, <coughs> um, if you're looking for a Tenkara specific guide, I also have a list uh, on my links page of, of guides kind of broken down by region, but I don't know how up to date that is. So Google that, but there, there might be a guide uh, in your area or, or if not, just hook up with someone in your area that, that does uh, Tenkara fish that's been at it for a while. Um, put, put something out on uh, Facebook or something and says, hey, I live in, you know, whatever. Uh, anyone Tenkara fish? And uh, I'll, I'll uh, treat you to lunch if you can take me out fishing for the day. Um, just being, having that one-on-one -on -one in our, in our uh, personal experience with a guide uh, or just someone who knows it is just going to be infinitely helpful to your, to your learning curve. So I, I think um, gu guides are just, and everyone who says that, or everyone, who, everyone who's hired a guide says that. They say the exact same thing. I'm so glad I did that because I learned so much from it. Would you, do you agree with that, Chuck? No, I was going to say, yeah, I, those are great points, and I fully agree with you. Um, you know, guides are people who are out there most times every day, all day. They have filtered through a lot of the garbage of what works and what doesn't work. Most of them are more than willing to share information with you. Uh, we'll spend time teaching you, tuning up your you know, your casting if it's a little off. Uh, if If you catch a fish... Most of them will explain to you why you caught that fish and why you caught it and why it was there. <laughs> Instead of so it just, just have, being dumb luck, right? Yeah, you yeah. just have to ask, know it enough to ask the questions. Right. And the Discover Tenkara website, yeah, that is just a resource that it just seems like it's – every time I open it up, I find something new. There's, God, I've never read this before. This is really good information. So I know. Um, yeah, I'd agree on all accounts, so – yeah, and uh, one more. There's a. Um, it's only available on DVD right now. Although I am currently working with them to see if we can get it digitized. Um, it's called the the Underwater World of Trout. Um, it, it's a series of videos, uh, and they have uh, kind of some a lot of the topics uh, Chuck was just talking about: feeding lies, presentation, um, uh, all, all kinds of uh, fish behavior uh, videos, and it's all underwater footage. So we talk. You know, it's it's astonishing to me how much of our, you know, the content generated about fly fishing is above the water. We show pictures of our flies when they're dry in the vise, and we show pictures of the, the, the surface of the stream or the fish after we take it out of the water. But there's, there's, there isn't a lot of underwater footage, which is interesting because our quarry is underwater. So, um, but anyway, th this video series is all underwater footage. Um, it's, to me, some of the greatest uh, uh, footage for trout as it relates to fly fishing ever done. Um, anyway, there, there's just lots of things in there that you'll learn about how the fish, you know, the fish may not be where you think they are. Uh, matter of fact, there's one little clip I'm thinking of, and I think Anthony Naples commented on it. He said, after I watched that, I don't know how I ever caught a fish in my entire life <laughs> because, because it challenges your perception. So, you know, the current's going this way in the surface, and so you think, oh, the fish is going to be heading upstream. But in reality, there's, a, another, there's an undercurrent that goes the opposite direction, so the fish is facing the opposite direction. So this vid seeing the fish in their natural habitat, we're trying to go into this alien environment. That's their familiar environment. But we, we, we focus so much on the outside of that environment, right? But this is a good chance to dive underwater and kind of see how the fish actually behave, where they actually are, right? You might think they're in front of that rock, but they're not. They're over by that log, right? Why? So it's it just a great, great um, series, and hopefully it'll be digitized soon. But it is available for DVD, um, and uh, all the link, all the books that uh, Chuck just mentioned, I'll have uh, links to on my website. There, there'll be a, a blog post for this podcast, so just go to tenkaratalk.com for those. Well, even at the at the Oni class uh, that we were all at, Oni uh, we Oni. we spent probably what two hours sitting there having a tabletop discussion on a picnic table using rocks and sticks and bone, you know, things like that to illustrate different you know, portions of the stream. Was Rob Worthington was leading the conversation, and we were all talking about you know why fish are in a stream and why they are and how you would approach that with a fly rod. You know, we, we put the rock down and everybody automatically assumes the fish are going to be behind the rock. Well, really, they're not. They're really yeah. off to the sides or in, you know, in the pillow in the front of it. But that was just a great conversation because we had all these different perspectives. And I think we all learned something from each other simply because we were willing to, to get into that, that level of depth on it. 
And there were some folks who never had really thought about that, but that's but that's the same thing as this video you're talking about. Um, Ralph and Lisa Cutter, I cannot remember the yes. name of his book. Um, he was one of the earlier ones who had done the videos, and you know they were showing a midge underneath the water, and this thing is almost bright colored, and it's mirrored. And he was saying like they were showing he had a fly drifting down the stream, and how many times the fish had came up and had tapped that fly, yeah. and, let and it she go. hadn't even felt the felt strike. It, right. I remember that scene. I know exactly what scene you're talking about. Yeah, I just I don't want to misquote and name the book wrong or the video series wrong, but it's Ralph and Lisa Cutter. I actually met him uh, up in um, uh, Nevada. I was in a hardware store up there, and they had a little fly fishing section, and I was buying his book. And the guy <laughs> in the store says, hey, you buying that book? And he says, yeah. He goes, well, you want to meet Ralph? And I said, well, where's Ralph? He goes, hang on. So he <laughs> runs over to the other store, and he comes back. Ralph Cutter was in there buying a hammer. So I got to oh, meet wow. him, and he autographed my book for me in the store. Oh, nice. so, so. Yeah, I f I'm glad you brought that up. I forgot about the gr great, great footage. Um, so, uh, I think didn't uh, Gary Border, he's done quite a bit. Of, yeah, Gary's. Uh, Gary's got quite a few videos, and he's he said that he just came out with his book, Casting One, and there's going to be Casting Two and Casting Three. Hmm. That was part of that podcast I was listening to last night. Uh, great guy. I met him on a, the Pier Marquette River up in Michigan back oh, in 1982, um, and he actually gave me a leader <laughs> because the leader I had, I had screwed up, and it was really funny because at that time, I really didn't understand who he was, and so he gives me this leader, and he explains to me, and he he told me why I was I was fishing this one run and I was approaching it wrong. He told me where to place. I was fishing a dry fly and he told me where to place it. And sure enough, next cast I caught caught a fish. And it wasn't until weeks later that I realized who I was talking to standing at a river. <laughs> wow. Well, boy, Chuck, we could uh, probably talk about this all day, but um, we should probably wrap it up. Do you have any kind of I don't know final thoughts? Closing uh, advice. My, my, my final thoughts, you know, I'm going to lean towards, you know, Tenkara. Um, like I said, ten, Tenkara is simple. We present it as simple. It's uh, marketed as simple, but it's it's not simple. It's and I I enjoy that aspect of it because, like I said, I, I go with that. The more you know, the less you need. Um, but then it throws that responsibility on the individual to go back and, and to learn more, to be really, really successful at it. You don't have to, but if you want to be a, a very good fisherman or at least a, a decent fisherman, you really need to spend some time doing that. And whether it's tying flies, whether it's casting a tenkara rod or a conventional fly rod, uh, the, the onus is on you to, to, you know, on the outcome of your experience, whether you're going to go on a stream and be frustrated or have an enjoyable day catching catching a few fish here and there, and walking away with some level of success that you know you earned that success because you put that time in. So I stress anybody, whether you're a Tenkara practitioner, you're somebody who's experienced at it, or somebody who's just learning it, every now and then go back, focus on the basics, reaffirm your knowledge of the basics, or take the time to learn the basics because those are what throughout your fishing life will will make it more enjoyable for you. So well said. Well said. Agree, hundred percent. So, um, okay. Well, th thanks again, Chuck. Uh, again, I'll have links to everything we talked about on TenkaraTalk.com. So, just go there and look for episode thirteen. So, thanks again, Chuck. All right. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it, man. It's been great. It's great talking to you, man. All right. Bye.